Sonja, first of all, congratulations to an amazing movie. It's your first movie, and you chose such a specifically political and sensitive issue. Why the, why the topic of drone and drone pilots? What is it that fascinates you about it? Well, um, I, you know, I'm a journalist, an investigative journalist, and I, I'm just interested in you know, global issues and political issues. And with drones, I, um, I had a feeling I didn't know enough about it, and there was not enough information out there. And I, I really wanted to speak to people who are involved in a program, who, who really know what's going on. So. That's why I, I started the research. And, and when I started out, at, at the beginning, I wasn't sure if I wanted to make a film about drone warfare or veteran suicides. And um, the US, 22 veterans a day kill themselves, um, which is, I think, a very um, shocking number. So um, I, was, I was looking at these two issues. And um, when, I, when I found my first um, character, Heather, um, my, my first um, protagonist in my, my film, um, very early on she told me that she has lost three of her former colleagues to suicide. So, um, you know, I, I understood that this is an issue um, in a drone program as well. How long does it take from the initial idea to, to go for that topic until today, the world premiere? Three years. Three years with a lot of work, um, seven days a week. Um, it, it really was um, an intense project. Um, the research, of course, was most of the work. Um, just you know, understanding um, all the intricacies of you know, the, the drone war. Um, of course, the military likes to use acronyms, make things very, very difficult and complicated to understand for a civilian. So um, it, it really took quite some time you know, to, to, to understand everything and to grasp the magnitude of this program. Um, so yeah, three years from beginning till, till this day. At yesterday's press screening, you said that financing documentary films is always incredibly difficult. So how did you finance National Bird? And maybe follow-up question for Ines, what, you as a producer, what made you trust such a young filmmaker to take on such a difficult topic for her first Yes, that's movie? an answer for Ines. Okay, is this on? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, yes, so it's, it's you know, not just a topic. Independent documentary filmmaking is uh, difficult uh, to get funding for. Sonia wrote an incredibly, um, you know, you know, well put treatment. It was interesting from the beginning and she got um, a, a grant from ITVS, who was our first funder, um, in the development stage to make um, a trailer, uh, get legal counsel, um, and put things together, which then led to more funding. Um, in Germany, she also got development funding from the Kuratorium Junger Deutscher Film, and they're here somewhere, so uh, thank you for coming on board early. Um, and this early money is really important because then you can show a proof of concept, you can go out and start shooting. And then that led to more production funding, um, and we were lucky um, to then get a, a a large, um, a large funding from ITVS, the Independent Television Service in the United States, and then um, also get on board um, uh, the Filmförderung Hamburg Schleswig-Holstein. They should also be here somewhere, thank you. Uh, and then um, we uh, co-partnered with the NDR, Norddeutsche Rundfunk, also here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, they became our German uh, broadcaster and co-producer. And then uh, last but not least, uh, their Deutsche Film photo from, uh, came on board as well. And that kind of closed the budget. So it sounds kind of easy when I say it like that. <laughs> uh, but these are, you know, this is also a process. Just like the filmmaking itself, the financing is also a process. You know? um, but again, Sonia put forward like, a great idea, super compelling. And you know, you know, we are grateful for these funders to come on board and see that, see that early, you know, because that's always, you know, a bit of a risk for the financiers too. So at what, at what point did you get involved in the project? So I came on board uh, about a year and a half ago. And, you know, and I also was super impressed with the treatment. I, I mean, I was just, it was so fascinating to me. I mean, I live in, I've been in the United States for 20 years and I know, you know, I, I pay attention to these things. It's interesting to me as well. And I was just so impressed. Like, here comes Sonia and, you know, by herself, she had started working with Torsten Lapp, the cameraman. 
and just what the two of them had done it to that point on their own in that country where things like that are really difficult to do. It was super impressive to me and I really wanted to help her because you can't do this on your own. This is a really big undertaking. And you know, I just I was re I just really I'm I'm so, you know, thankful to have been part of that. I really thought, you know, she just, you know, kicked butt. <laughs> Um, I guess having such prominent executive producers helps with the financing as well. You have er Errol Morris and Wim Wenders. Are they just two big names on the screen or were they involved in, in the making of the movie as well? Well, they weren't directly involved in the making of the movie, but um, they, you know, they have been really big supporters um, for me and my team in, in the sense that, you know, for one of the reasons that I had contacted both of them, you know, Wim Wenders actually very early on in the process during development, um, was to, you know, have more safety and security for my characters, my protagonists, and, um, and the project itself, you know, by attaching such a big name. And what I did was I, I contacted his assistant and I, you know, I, I asked for an appointment and had to wait like everyone else who, you know, was trying to get an appointment with, um, someone like Wim Wenders, and eventually, um, you know, he, he had time for me, and I showed him my, my work in progress, um, 10 minutes that I had already um, filmed and edited, and he, he looked at it, and he immediately said, you know, while watching it, you know, whatever you need, you know, I want to help you with that, and I said, you know, do you want to be my executive producer? And he said, yes, right on the spot. So, um, and then, um, the vendors and, and, and me, we both contacted Aaron Morris um, together. You know, both of them have a lot of name recognition in, in the United States. And, and, and my, my thought was really, you know, um, and I, I know that from, you know, the, the attorney of my, my protagonist that, you know, the, the higher profile, the more publicity we get with this, the more protection it will mean for, you know, the whistleblowers, the people involved in this project. And yeah, and then during the course of you know post production, um, um, Wim Wenders and Aaron Morris actually looked at cuts and and, and gave feedback, and um, and also you know were available whenever I had you know questions since this is my my first theatrical film. And I believe it was one of the two who also suggested the title, right? Yes, indeed. So um, the. The final, uh, not not the final song. The, the final song is with uh, the composer of the score, but um, the rap song that um, is called also National Bird. It was written for um, this this movie, this film, and um, and the the rapper um, Soul and and his um, his producer DJ Payne One. They um, they titled the song National Bird, and when we when we played, you know. The, the first cut um, to Wim Benders, and then he heard the song. He said, "Wow, it's a it's a really great song, and that's a really good title. You you should use this title." And we all said, "Wow, yeah, you're right. Actually, it's it is a good title, National Bird. And um, this is a new National Bird. Is one line in the song. Its wingspan is 66 feet. Sorry, bald eagle, you're obsolete. And I think it's a pretty pretty smart um, line, clever." <laughs> Now, b before we talk about the protagonists in, in detail, because I think they, they have three incredibly interesting stories, um, Jessalyn, maybe you can give us some context. How big is the drone program in the US? How many people suffer from uh, PTSD? You know, we don't have an actual number of how many people are in the drone program because that is considered a state secret. Um, from talking to people that I represent, they think it the number's around 1,000, but again, um, it could be much larger than that because the drone program has been proliferating. Um, and also, there's no way to find it out because it involves getting information from the Air Force, getting information from the CIA, and now getting information from private contractors, which is nearly impossible. Um, yeah, I think the government could come up with a decent approximation number but they're deliberately not. 
And in terms of people affected by PTSD, there, there was recently a study by the Air Force which said only 4% um, of drone pilots or people working in the drone program had reported some sort of um, PTSD s symptoms, but does that number sound accurate to you? Not at all. I represent 12 different drone whistleblowers. Every single one of them has PTSD. Um, they also, most of them have depression, anxiety, um, drug addictions. Not all of them have drug addictions, a number of them do. Um, violent outbursts, which can be part of the PTSD. Um, many of them are unemployed, two of them are homeless. Um, so definitely, no, I would say PTSD is the common denominator among all of them. And in terms of the political context, as Europeans, we, we tend to think, well, Obama came into office and uh, he, um, he, he's the be better president, of course, than the last one. And uh, he protects whistleblowers and the drone program probably has gotten smaller. That's not the case, is it? No, Obama was elected on a platform of openness and transparency, but he has led one of the most secretive presidencies ever. And that's not me saying that. That's the New York Times saying that when it comes to press freedom and free speech, he has been worse than Nixon. And, and as part of that, um, I, I represent not just the drone whistleblowers, but Edward Snowden and a number of other whistleblowers from the NSA and a number of CIA whistleblowers, all of whom have tried to blow the whistle on some of the biggest scandals of my generation, on torture, on secret surveillance, on, on drones, and they have been prosecuted for espionage, a law that's meant to go after spies, not whistleblowers. And then we have the presumptive Democratic nominee in the presidential election who has mishandled in a far more careless way her classified information, you know. I mean, if you're part of the elite, if you're General Petraeus, if you're Hillary Clinton, if you're politically powerful or well-connected, you get to be on a book tour, you get to make Hollywood movies, you get to run for president, you get to advise a president. Um, and meanwhile, uh, you know, I have a number of clients who have been in jail and served time in jail currently are still in jail. Um, and then others like Thomas Drake, who, uh, you know, it, we ended up, the whole case fell apart and they dropped all the espionage counts against him. Edward Snowden's living in exile. I have a number of clients who are either living in exile or being wrongfully detained or are in hiding. And that is completely frightening, especially considering these people tried to expose fraud, waste, abuse, illegality, and dangers to public health and safety. And meanwhile, people in positions of power reveal classified information on a daily basis for the purpose of fluffing their resume or, or, or getting a headline um, or just convenience, you know, so. Sorry about that, oops. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we, it's a real strange dichotomy right now in our country, um, and I think it's kind of coming to a head. And uh, I was surprised when I saw the movie that uh, especially two of the protagonists are so young. Is that, uh, is that normal? Are most of these drone workers that young? In the position of the, the analyst, these imagery analysts um, like Heather, um, many of them are very, very young, um, 18 to 24, 25. I think Heather flew her first mission when she was 20 or 21. Um, some are, are younger than that. And, um, you know, these, these positions are, um, they carry a lot of responsibility with them. Um, you know, Heather describes in the film how, you know, she had to, you know, look at these videos and, and pick out essentially, you know, who is a terrorist or who is, is a civilian. So making that call, making that choice at such a young age um, that would lead to the death of someone, um, you know, to, to do that is, is, um, must be incredibly difficult. And I understand how, how many other um, 
analysts like Heather are also affected by by this job, and um, and and especially afterwards when you hear about civilians who have been killed and and not knowing and you know carrying this guilt with you, um, and you know a lot of us, as Jessen has just said, and a lot of the people um, that I've spoken to have. Um, yeah, PTSD and, and, and the trauma. And I really think the military has to take care of their people because um, we all see, and I, you know, Heather, um, Lisa, they all have lost friends to suicide. And, and, um, and, and right now the, the situation is, is dire. Heather at one point says, she's not the one who pushes the button. Who is the one who pushes the button in the end? How does that decision making take place? Um, the person who pushes the button is the pilot. Then there's the sensor operator who, um, who actually moves the camera around and he also lasers the target, the, the intelligence, um, intelligent missiles, um, bombs, he guides them into the target. And, um, but in, in the decision making process that leads up to it, there's there's a whole crew of people, and that's what I actually wanted to show with this film, that as Lisa actually says in the film, it's not just, you know, one pilot, you know, one, one drone, one unmanned plane that is the, the drone war, the drone program, but there's this large, gigantic system behind it, the surveillance system, and in fact, the drone is just, you know, like the mouse for a computer, the... the the DGS, the surveillance system, is the much larger piece, which is also a weapons system in its own right. And um, so the analysts who look at the imagery, the signals intelligence analysts who actually you know, find the targets using the technology on the drone, um, you know, they are all involved in, in the, the kill chain and that process. And, um, and yeah, you know, people like Heather, they actually, have this, this big decision to make where they are the ones who analyze the video and you know you've all seen some of these videos it's black and white they're you know kind of black blobs um, depending on you know how, how far the drone is away from the ground and they have to make that call and decide is this person carrying a shovel or is he carrying a weapon is there a kid then you have to delay until you know the information reaches the US um, you know and in this time a kid could run into the frame you know all these these things that you know make the drone war and the drone program such a problem. And at one point, um, both Heather and I think Lisa as well suggest that the number of kills a drone pilot uh, does is somehow good for his or her CV. Uh, Jessalyn, what is that about? Yeah, I it was a really macabre discovery when I found out that some of my clients showed me diplomas that they got with the number of people that they killed. And they got these every couple months or so. And you get promoted based on how many people you kill. And it doesn't matter if it's a good kill or a bad kill. You know, you don't even have the time ever find out who, who they were. But there's, it's incentivizing killing. And I believe in the film, there was, Lisa had, I mean, Lisa had a medal, medals for listing a hundred, was, was the number? So it actually listed 121,000 certain targets that she helped identify, um, but it also listed the number of targets that are being killed. Um, but yeah, it actually, they put it on, on a medal that you're supposed to hang on your wall. Sonia, how did you find the three American protagonists, but also the Afghan family? So, um, well, I found Heather um, through a little bit of detective work. I, I was, when I started my research, I was um, you know, t talking to people that I know in the veterans community, um, people who are in the military, in the activist community, because I've worked on, on similar stories before. And um, I, on, on one activist website or forum, I came across a photograph and it, it had a young woman on it who covered up her face till about here. Um, and she had a sheet of white paper in, in front of her face, and it said something like, um, you know, not everything you hear about the drone program is, is right, you know, I, I, I know what's really going on, something along those lines. And 
I was, I was wondering, is this person who I'm seeing there, you know, holding up this, you know, this piece of paper, is, is this a person who says she knows what's going on? And um, the, po the photo was posted by, by someone else, and so I, you know, it took me a while to, to, to find her, and I was cross-referencing people, you know, was, um, looking who's connected to whom, and um, went on different websites. I don't know exactly how long it took me, but at, at one point I came across one photograph and I, I recognized the eyes. And I contacted this woman, I said, is this, you know, I saw this photograph, um, it, do you know about the drone program? Have you been in it? And she said yes. And that's, you know, we met and, and, um, and yeah, that's how, how the whole process and this film started and then um, Lisa, I met at a, at a veter veterans gathering. Um, she's usually very low key about her work, what she was doing in the military. And somehow I spoke to, to one person whom she just told that, you know, just one word, you know, she said, I was, I'm, I was a droney. And that person was, you know, picked me up from the airport. and. Um, and, and told me that, and I said, oh, I'd really like to meet her. And that's how we met, and, um, and Daniel actually met at um, another, um, you know, kind of, yeah, at, at another event um, um, of activists. And, um, and then in Afghanistan, um, I, I knew about the transcript. The transcript was part of a 2,000-page investigation um, regarding this, this family, and I wanted to, to, f to find them, and um, and I, I um, contacted a an Afghan journalist, um, um, Aymal Yakubi, um, who's credited my film, and um, who has um, worked on that case before. Um, and I, I asked him, you know, can can you can you help me? Can you, you know, find them somehow? Can you reach out to them? And yeah, I mean, we didn't really know if they would come, if they were the you know, really derail um, people from the transcript until they actually travel to Kabul because we couldn't travel out to them. It's, it's too dangerous for a foreigner to go to this place. So they travel three days and three, three nights. And the first thing they actually said to us, to me, um, to our translators was that they are very, very thankful that someone is asking them to tell their stories because no one had asked them, and this is a very publicized case, and not a single person has gone out, or you know, gone out to them, contacted them, and asked them to tell their story. And and they they really said it's you know we really want to have our voice. And one of the the first sound bites in the first interview with them, we interviewed them over the course of a couple of days, a few days, um, is the is the man with the black beard, he's the the elder of the group, and one of the first things he said is I. You know, we all came here because we wanted the world community to know what has happened to us. We want to have our voice, and you know, we want to tell. You want to show them what has happened to, uh, to to us, and we actually want to ask them to stop. One last question before we open it up um, for the audience. What was the chronology like? When did you get involved as the lawyer? Where are you, their lawyer, before the movie already? Or did you contact them? What was that? Sonia got me involved. I was already representing a number of high-profile um, whistleblowers who were being prosecuted for espionage. So I had some visibility there. And Sonia contacted me. Um, you know, initially, before anyone had any legal problem, I mean, the one that came up during the film, that was after I had been involved. It was just a precautionary measure, and I have to give props to Sonia um, as a documentarian for taking such care to protect the protagonist in her film. I, there have been another documentary that involved three of my clients, and no, never once did anyone consult me about possible dangers, that, you know, about what they were talking about. Um, so, I mean, it's just so responsible and above board to do that. And it was wise to do that because, as you learn in the film, um, Daniel does end up getting criminally, you know, under the criminal process. So, um, that was how it developed, and I'm still representing them because 
I expect that, I hope there won't be any retaliation for the film, but if there is, you know, we'll be there. And do you know where Daniel is right now? Because in the end of the movie it says, and at an undisclosed location. He, he, you know, we can't get into that. Okay. <laughs> Then uh, let's open up um, for questions from the audience. We have two people with microphones, I think. If you're not comfortable asking the question in English, feel free to do it in German. There's three people up here who understand German and will just translate. And we'll start with a question um, right here in the front. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very uh, for a very powerful film. Um, I wonder where it could lead, because um, as in the film we've seen the, the boxes open, there will be more drones. Uh, so what, what will happen? Um, is the solution better techniques that you can identify uh, targets better? Or what, what, what would you suggest? The reason I made this film is to actually start a discussion. I think there has not been enough transparency about the drone program. Um, you know, the military doesn't disclose how they are targeting people, how they are finding people, and um, they don't disclose how many people are being killed and how many countries exactly, and they are not disclosing how many civilians are being killed. And I, I really think there's the need for more transparency and overall, you know, a much larger discussion amongst, you know, the, the American public, but also the public in, in other countries, because the US is not the only country that is using combat drones. And I, you know, I, I really hope that this film will add to this discussion because drone warfare um, is, is, is very problematic in, in, in terms of, you know, um, you know, th there are legal issues involved. It's, this technology is so substantially changing the way war is being waged because you, you don't have the, the concept of self-defense anymore because all the, the people involved, the crew, they are in complete safety. And um, so I, I really think it's important that, you know, we as a public, um, the, the societies of, you know, of um, the, the countries that are, that are using drones, you know, we all discuss and decide together with information, more information, if this is the kind of warfare we want to have. And that's what I'm hoping to do with the film. And I just wanted to add something to that. Um, what I really liked about Sonia's approach is um, what we find very often with uh, especially TV documentaries or reportages that people too often, uh, you're preaching to the choir and people too often don't pay attention to these hard issues when you have a bunch of experts talking about a, t a subject, right? So what I liked really about Sonia's approach from the beginning is you have to get to a much broader audience and you usually don't do that with the expert, expert talk. You do that with really talking to the people who are on the ground and you, who, who can share with you their emotional life. And I think this is so well captured here and we really believe that through you know, some more emotion and really learning about what's happening with individuals, um, you know, we can open this up and start this discussion that, uh, you know, Sonia wants, wants to have because it's really, you know, it, 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 it hits you here, I think, and not so much here. And I think that's what the American general public needs a little bit more. All right, there's another question right here in the front. Hello, thank you for a very powerful film. Um, I think it's very important and I'm very happy that Wim Wenders is going to bring the word or the drone wars to Germany, which I think also is also very um, underexposed. I had a question about the reenactment of the transcript. At the end, you cut it off at a very fateful uh, part. Remember the kill chain? Would you care to elucidate a little bit more on that? On what exactly? Can you um, The kill chain? Remember the kill yeah. chain. Yeah. Do you know any more about that or why oh, that was well, mentioned in that, in that particular? Well, kill chain is the whole process that leads up to you know, the, the killing of a target, as they call it. And so um, I, I believe, you know, in this case, I, you know, there, there's no way that I could have talked to the people who, um, you know, the, the crew, but um, you know, the, the order is kill chain, so he's just saying to his other crew, you know, remember, like, now, we're doing it now, kill chain. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's what, what you hear in there. But I think what this transcript in particular and and the the, the exact parts that I chose here um, show um, is that kind of what leads up to you know to 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 a tragic incident like this. You have you have pilots and a crew that are trigger happy, and um, you know who 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 feel safe, um, they, they all, of, of course, want to pre prevent us, you know, one of my um, interview partners in film says the next 9-11, so it, it's always about, you know, protecting their own troops, but they also get into this mode where they're like, okay, okay, we, we want to kill now, you know, it's, it's, this must be, you know, this must be, you know, a, a terrorist group, and all of that really leads up, and I just want to say that the, the parts that I chose of the transcript are very, very representative. The, the transcript is 80 pages long, and whenever I read it, and I often take it out just because I forget things, and I just read through it again, and I'm like, gosh, this, this is just as bad. Why didn't I choose this part? And so, um, yeah, it is representative, but that's what it kills you. Thank you. I just have another question, maybe for Jesslyn or anyone else. Um, why do you think it's so hard for the drone operators, pilots, um, to get... Um, benefits for PTSD, thank you. I think PTSD is an enormous problem that the Veterans Affairs Administration in the US has been grappling with for a long time. And I, I think it's because it'll debunk the myth that drones are harmless, that you can just sit there and drone people all day and then go home to Alexandria and have dinner with your family and everything's hunky-dory. I mean, it's one of those things that, that deflates a myth that nobody gets hurt. Um, and here in this film, we see, guess what? People on the ground in these other countries are getting hurt. The people who are on the ground in the U.S. running these programs get hurt. And so if, every, if you know, both sides agree this is not working, then why is it still happening? And I submit it's because the people in positions of power have not had to deal with this sort of combat. And I think um, the... The VA has been reluctant to recognize PTSD, even um, from people who were in the battlefield. They've come up with traumatic brain injury diagnoses far more often. Um, but this, this myth that you were not boots on the ground, therefore you can't have PTSD, has got to end. And hopefully with Heather's case, which is one of the first where it was recognized, that's a, a good sign and a good note in the movie, um, in her journey, that she's able to get treatment. Um, and I have a number of other clients who are still fighting that um, disability benefit battle. Okay, we have time for one last question. The lady here in the middle. Thank you for the movie. Um, yeah, I think it's very important and yet felt very uncomfortable sitting in my chair watching this brutal truth. But thank you. And I was wondering how about showing this movie in the US? What's the plan there? Speaking of showing it to a broad public, yeah, showing to the public. It, it will be shown in the US. Um, our largest funder, ITVS, the Independent Television Service, which is supported by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, um, is, actually has a show on PBS, um, US Public Television. So they are a co-producer and it will actually be shown on public television in America. So that's a really, really big thing because it will reach the American public. Um, and in addition, it will, um, you know, it, we will actually have some other release that I can't really talk, can't about, talk about yet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there will be, and um, public television is a little bit further out, um, and there will be an earlier release. And yes, so it's very much the plan, and was from the beginning, that um, this film, uh, you know, come hello high water, this is going to be, of course, shown to the American public, and that, you know, we're going to go out, and we're going to go, uh, you know, both to Washington, D.C., but also into rural communities where they're heavily recruiting right now. Um, you know, the, the armies uh, and, and the Air Force are heavily recruiting. So we do want this to be seen by as many people as possible, um, you know, because we think it's that important.
there's so much more to be discussed and uh, I hope everyone will um, continue the discussion at their homes. But for now, thank you very much, Ines Hoffmann-Kana, Jessalyn Reddick and Sonja Kennebeck.